For most of you, uh, or at least many of you, Curtis Wilson will need no introduction. Um, for those who don't know, Curtis Wilson is an eminent historian of science. I, for one, learned, learned an awful lot from some of his papers on Kepler. And um, he's here to talk about the lunar problem, and in fact, a number two of the lunar problem. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm very honored and happy to be able to attend this Harbor Fest uh, for more years than I can likely remember. Bill has been a, uh, his spiritedness, his kind of do-itiveness, his stick-to-itiveness has really inspired me and he supported, spurred me on in my studies. Um, this the uh, topic I'm going to talk about actually uh, took its start uh, at the University of Western Ontario, I think in uh, 1990. I tend to say 1891. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I heard George Smith in a meeting here uh, say something like this. That first lunar theory to be free from serious flaw uh, was the Hill Brown theory. And I decided about that time that I needed to explicate that statement. Now I met him by chance yesterday and discovered that he thought that statement was one he made out of uh, reading Brower and Clemenson's Celestial Manic Mechanics, he thought it quite wrong. Uh, I spent about nine years explicating it. So, <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know how this will bear out. But I, the reason he said that was that in the Hill Brown Theory, as published in 1919, uh, there is an empirical term. Actually, a great empirical term, GET. Uh, and Hill knew there was going to be probably, probably going to be one. Uh, Newcomb knew there was one that he couldn't get rid of. Brown tried to think his way out of this. They all they all agreed with George Smith entirely that. Uh, there was something, well, they thought there was something missing. And that was discovered by And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I think there's something right about the Hill Brown theory that we need to grasp. My book is coming out with Springer. Uh, they tell me now in July, I still have to get the page proofs from India they're coming. Some young lady there promises them on page proofs on May 27th. Anyway, now this title I'd better say something about. It's, it's made to scare away casual readers, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the Hill Brown Theory of the Moon's Motion, it's coming to be and short lived ascendancy. 1877 to 1984. Well, that's uh, the Hill Brown theory was accepted for the lunar ephemerides and the nautical almanacs of U.S., U.K., Germany, France, Spain, at least in 1923, and then it was demoted from that role in 1984. 61 years. Prior to the Hill Brown theory, the basis of the lunar ephemerides was Peter Andreas Hansen's theory, uh, which was adopted by France and England in 1862. So it too had 61 years of uh, being the basis for the uh, nautical almanacs. 
but there's great difference because in uh, last in, in most of the time that uh, Hansen's theory was used, it was realized to be uh, flawed in an important way. Hansen had, he had used differential equations, uh, reduced the terms from Newton's theory. This was the first such theory good enough to be the basis of the ephemerides of the nautical almanac. Always before the nautical almanac had been based on large-scale comparison between the terms of the theory and observations. Whereas you know, the Hansen had introduced numbers for the uh, constants in the theory early on. And what this did was to obliterate obscure the path of his deduction. You couldn't go back and look over things again and see where a mistake had been. But the uh, Hansen theory was known to be incorrect, it needed correction. Uh, so how you, you couldn't do it uh, responsibly. I should emphasize that always before Hansen, the, this the, the Nautical Almanac, uh, starting in 1767, was based on comparisons with observation. And this, uh, the, the first one to, uh, the first theory on which the uh, Nautical Almanac was based was, was that of Tobias Meyer, the tables of Tobias Meyer. Died in uh, 1762 at the age of 39. So he was a uh, print worker. He uh, made a lot of observations of uh, occultations of stars by the moon. And he was good at it, I observe. And he used, he didn't have a method of least squares, nobody did. At least until the 1790s. The Alf study must have had the method of these squares because anyone with his head screwed on right would have the method of these squares. <laughs> he didn't. Um, instead, it's, the method was a sort of, well, we don't really know, but it's a, a method of combining equations of condition by subtraction and addition in such a way as to make coefficient of resulting coefficient of some terms large and that of other terms small and then you neglect the, the terms that are small and of course it's liable to lead to uh, mistakes but uh, Meyer seems to have been especially good at uh, getting results out of his tables were revised in 1778 by Charles Mason on the Mason and Dixon line team using 1100 of Bradley's observations, same sort of technique. Uh, another revision was made by Johannes Tobias Berg in 1806 using 3000 of Maskelyne's observations. Then the tables were revised again by uh, Carl, uh, Johann Carl Burkhardt in 1812 using 4,000 observations. We don't know how those, I don't know if we have any evidence as to how those observations were made. But the tables were revised somewhat as time went on. But there was always this dependence on observation. Hansen was the first set of tables derived from the theory, ostensibly 
without any uh, uh, illegitimate use of observations. Uh, now, Meyer has left a statement. Meyer, Tobias Meyer, derived, uh, derived a, a set of lunar, uh, a lunar theory analytically. And he wrote about why he did that. The theory, he says, I'm quoting now, the theory has this inconvenience that many of the inequalities cannot be deduced from it accurately unless one should pursue the calculation in which I have now exhausted nearly all my patients much further. My aim is rather to show that at least no argument against the goodness of my theory of my tables can be drawn from the theory. This is made evidently, this is most evidently gathered from the fact that the inequalities found in the tables, which have been corrected by comparison with many observations, never differ from those of the theory alone, that the theory alone supplies by more than one half arc minute. Therefore, it is evident that these small errors derive from the side of the theoretical calculus rather than from the tables. I think the conclusion we draw is that the trouble was one of slow convergence. The theory was not converging. And I'm not talking about true mathematical convergence. I'm just talking about practically. The theory didn't give you small, get to small enough terms fast enough. <coughs> Now this slow convergence was also met with by other people, Euler, Perro, and D'Alembert in the middle of the 18th century uh, devised uh, derived theories from Newton's law. And the accuracy of their theories were uh, between three and five arguments. That was not enough get the lowest prize offered by the British Admiralty, which was 10,000 pounds per pound sterling, a lot of money. But you had to get within two arc minutes, because then you would get the longitude at sea within a degree. These uh, theorists also found slow convergence in deriving the motion of the lunar apps. All of them, using different procedures, got as the first figure one, uh, about one half of the moon's uh, upside of motion. The moon, moon's apps, perigee or apogee, whichever you like, uh, moves over three degrees a month. They got one and a half degrees a month. That's again a case of slow conversion. In 1749, Clairaut performed a second order approximation. He had had that idea in mind all along, but it was an onerous task and he kept postponing it. Then he did it and found that he got a lot more of the motion of the apps. And a little later, D'Alembert went through four stages to get different contributions to the motion of the apps and then commented, he couldn't promise that this was to go on converging. As a matter of fact, that's the story of the whole lunar theory. You don't know really, I and mean, you don't have enough petitions for you that what we're doing is, is going to convert. Uh, now, the trouble with, as I've already mentioned, with Hansen's theory was this lack of transparency. You couldn't we couldn't correct it responsibly. Uh, we needed uh, a systematic, I haven't mentioned it, you need a systematic way of getting higher order approximations. That was something that Laplace 
never focused on with any uh, concentration. Uh, he made corrections to the learner theory from causal reason. For example, he said we know the, the moon attracts the Earth's equatorial bulge and contributes to the precession of the equinoxes. Therefore, the equatorial bulge must attract the moon and do something to the moon. So we went about finding out what that was. Um, but he was not at all careful about doing second order approximations in uh, such a way that you get the bigger ones and put her down to the smaller ones. So, the boss was very upbeat about the chance of getting a theory that uh, was good enough to uh, uh, a theory good enough to predict the moon uh, as accurately as the empiricists were doing. which meant you couldn't substitute numbers at an early stage. You had to carry the algebra through all the way. And it really got wrong. <coughs> the, the most complete and elegant of these uh, theories was that of uh, Delaunay. started around 1846. Two big volumes were published in 1860 and 1867, giving much of his theory. George William Hill, a mathematician working in the Nautical Almanac office, uh, started studying this in the 1870s and was wowed by it. He wrote he wrote a little article to introduce Delaunay to his American colleagues, uh, saying the method of treating the lunar theory adopted by Delaunay is so elegant that it cannot fail to become in the future the classic method of treating all the problems of celestial mechanics. Uh, the method of Delaunay uh, stems from Delaunay, who introduced 
introduced the notion of using as variables the elements, six elements uh, that Lagrange had introduced uh, of, of an orbit, six elements. And that Binet was dependent on Poisson, Poisson. Ninth order terms. These are two ninth order terms here. here, and here. Uh, ninth order in terms of this, the small parameters. Uh, italic M is the ratio of the sun's mean motion to the moon's mean motion. That's about one thirteenth. Uh, and uh, E is the eccentricity of the lunar orbit. That's about 1 over 18.5. When you actually multiply those things out, you, the terms, both these terms you know, get, uh, end up being less than 1. But that isn't the problem. The problem is, how big is the next term? It's not small. You need it to be a lot smaller than this in order to be, in a pragmatic way, sort of convinced that Okay, I'm getting somewhere. I can get the next decimal place. But actually, what was happening was that Delaunay um, uh, could not get the next decimal place. So he did something which uh, Hill decided was really <laughs> He, he took averages over the last few terms he calculated and said, well, that's the, the amount of increase here is going to be the amount of increase in the next term. And that just isn't so. I mean, it might be so approximately, but it might not. It might not be at all. Hill just turned thumbs down at this point and said, we have to start all over again. And he turned to Euler's lunar theory of 1772 uh, and studied that as an undergraduate. In this theory, Euler proposed dividing the inequalities into classes and uh, according to the small parameters. You'll note that the first one has to do with italic M or Roman M. Uh, Hill will come to prefer Euler had used Roman M. That's the synodic ratio of the sun's motion to the moon's synodic motion. It's, it's much the catching up with the sun. Uh, that's about 1 12th, a bigger number. Uh, if you start putting the series in terms of Roman M, they converge a little more rapidly. Uh, the, uh, the second class has to do with the eccentricity of the Nothing at all to do with the sun. Since though the sun dealing with that class, the sun is could be absent. Uh, then the lunar inclination is just the fact that it has to do with the 
fact that the bearer of it is inclined to be afflicted. E prime, it was the solar eccentricity, about 1 60th. Uh, it's just a small uh, variation, it was a small variation in the solar force. And solar parallax is about we mean the, I mean the parallax of the orbit, the lunar orbit with respect to the sun, which is about 1 over 390. So the first of these is the one that most uh, importantly introduces the sun. mentioned that in uh, 1766, Euler's son, Johann Albrecht Euler, presented a, a memoir to the uh, Berlin Academy entitled Reflections on the Variation of the Moon. Uh, it contains this announcement. I dare assert that if anyone succeeded in finding a perfect solution to the problem of variation, he would scarcely find any further difficulty in determining the true motion of the real moon. I asked Ronald Callinger, who's a geographer of Euler, whether he thought that John Albrecht had done, written that or did his Calvin just said right away, well, I think it was the following. Um, it, it has the, well, not exactly my typical quality, but uh, this is the statement of somebody who's struggled with the learner theory a long time and thinks this is the way to go. And he's right. I think I'm going to, uh, I'm going to shift ground for a moment right now and uh, talk about Tico and the variation. Yeah. Um, Tico discovered the variation in 1594. his observers to get the eclipses of the moon when the moon enters the Earth's shadow from the start all through the time of the eclipse. Well, uh, in 1590, he, the observers got there too late. They were celebrating or something for dinner. And, uh, the, the eclipse had already started. <coughs> Finally, um, Tico figured out uh, what was going on in, in 59, by 1594. What he did was observe the moon, but the moon will be eclipsed when it gets here if it's close enough to the eclipse. That happens about twice a year. Uh, it takes about seven days and nine hours for the other things being equal. I'll, I'll explain that for you. For the moon to go from first quarter to full. Observing when the Earth, when the moon is in here, you could discover there was a head up there where, what, where it should be if we take out the two big inequalities which have been in lunar theory since Ptolemy. 
One is sometimes called the elliptic inequality, a horrible name in my opinion. Uh, but it's, it's something that is observed because the moon, in going from its most rapid motion to its slowest motion, gets uh, ahead and behind of where mean motion So you have this, I'll call it so-called elliptic inequality. Going from perigee to aperture. It's not because people actually measure the size of the moon and said, oh, it's closer to the Earth now and brought away now. Uh, you couldn't do that very accurately, even after we started getting names of micrometers. No, it was, it was because the moon departs from mean motion by a lot. Six degrees and seventeen minutes or so. That's the elliptic. Then the election is a combination of two things. And that causes a colony discovery that produces a deviation of another degree and seventeen. Tico was discovering was that, when the Gestalt got figured out, was that the moon is moving most slowly, B, D, and C, uh, first order, last order, and most rapidly the syzygy is in with A, new moon, and B, full moon. Uh, and in between, it's Speeding up all around the year, going down. And Newton came along and explained this uh, beautifully. I'm going to change the diagram to uh, yeah. make it better, more close to scale. This is a fortunately poor diagram of the circle left out, but it's the same thing that we had. There's really a circle going through D, B, C, and A. And I'm making the lines to the sun perfectly parallel. In the first edition of the Pagetian, Newton said the horizontal solar parallax is 20 seconds. That would mean that if we take the radius of the moon's orbit as unit, that to get to the sun we have to go 171 of those units out that way to the sun. In the third edition, he says that the horizontal solar parallax is 10 and a half seconds. That means that taking this as given again, you have to go out uh, yeah, to uh, 100 uh, 325. I think it's 325. I've lost that. But anyway, um, by the 1760s, Euler was saying the horizontal solar parallax is 9 arc seconds. That puts us out 380 units. And today, we have a horizontal parallax of 8.79 arc seconds. That means 389 units out that way. So we're going out along that way. And might as well make these lines parallel. And then, let's take the the difference between the force on the Earth at T and the force on the Moon at P. Okay. But that difference 
because it's the yes, thing. We can split into two components, one radial going through the tube, the other as I think is, and right to the gadget to the orbit. And we see that one of them is causing the curvature of the orbit to decrease, right? Because it's attracted to the first place. The other is speeding the moon up. So the moon uh, is with less curvature of the orbit all the way around to the feet. Uh, with least curvature right here. And so it's speeding up to A and deceleration from A to B. That's exactly what T goes up. Then the same thing happens over again. Now you're subtracting the greater force on the Earth from the lesser force on the Moon. And the result will be a, a negative force out this way, which you can then spread into components. trying to suggest is that the big inequalities, elliptic inequality of X being subtracted out, we're able to see by this discovery of the variation something of a finer structure occurring in the lunar and what goes on. And what I'm this variation as it's called it you could just give it that like a name uh, is uh, a, a finer a finer tuned thing in very to speak than the old order Exactly what Hill thought, I, I don't know. I, he's, he's given to concision, uh, which I seem not to be. Anyway, um, uh, he introduced uh, some equations for. This situation with the, uh, the moon, and sun, and the earth. Is, uh, uh, I won't discuss them. He took these uh, equations, and these definitions of x and y, and those are chosen because. He's choosing rotating coordinates at this point. And uh, the x-axis goes from the Earth to the mean sun moving in the ecliptic. And he has the y-axis going at right angles to the x-axis through the moon and the Earth. And Choosing these odd multiples, I as a negative, choosing the odd multiples of the angle many times the time, um, the motion type of time. He will bring it about that he gets a periodic orbit. The, uh, that choice means that when the moon is on the x-axis, the line of syzygies, then uh, it's moving uh, at right angles to the x-axis. When it's on the y-axis, it's moving at right angles to the y-axis. And that will just keep repeating. So it's a periodic moment. And it gets us an ideal uh, periodic orbit. And then, 
ask what will happen if, for instance, we perturb it a little bit. Well, I should have, should have mentioned that in deriving those constants, he gets what looks very nice. That is, uh, it gets a1 over a zip sub zero group here, a minus one over two piece. Then he returns, he's, he's approximating my trigonometric series. And he's getting uh, what looks like very nice uh, burdens. Really, three places at least at each stage, either successive stages. To get the A sub zero, you have to introduce the mass of the dimension of the Introduction of it tries introducing a little eccentricity into that orbit. Um, suppose that we introduce into the differential equations first x sub 0 and x y sub 0, which are the coordinates for the variation curve that I've just been talking about. And then introduce x sub 0 plus delta y, de delta x, and y sub 0 plus uh, delta y. And you come out with these differential equations for delta x and delta y, where these are partial derivatives uh, evaluated for the coordinates in the variation program. In other words, he has a variation curve, as he calls it. And then he introduces a little bit of eccentricity, a little bit of departure from it, and asks the question, he knows that that will produce a hump somewhere. And there will be a, a maximum departure somewhere from the curve. And well that will move because only if you have an inverse square force directed to the earth will it stay fixed. But we now have, we know, sun acting. So mm -hmm. the hump will move. How fast? Well, he computes it and finds he gets a value differing from the actual motion of the moon's axis by 1.43%. 1.43%. Greater. He knew he would get greater because he left out of account the information of the moon goes over to the ecliptic, which the information increases the effect of the sun on within the plane of the world. Uh, this is uh, something I, as important as I can but to estimate. Remember that Euler, uh, Merrill, Dollander, on our first stage, one half outside of the ocean. Now he gets on a first stage calculation 1.43% from the observation. No one had ever come anywhere near that. Um, I'm going to, uh, must slight Brown, not going into detail about what he did. There's uh, one who received, Brown received the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1908, I think it was. Uh, the 
first thing I would be the society uh, gave an address. And among other things, noted that uh, got this from a colleague in the British Brown had always checked his results by to see that they were differential variations of the variation curve. And if I haven't made that clear, please ask a question. There's a variation curve that Hill has established. And then he, Hill has shown that a slight variation from that curve is going to produce an eccentricity, is going to, and the apps will move very, very close to what is observed. The, the strong guess conjecture is, I would say, that uh, Hill has found the right orbit in which to calculate this. And uh, now we're, Brown goes on to compute all the other deviations, all the other five or four classes of deviations. And these also are just infinitesimal found by that, differential variations from that variation curve. That is, I think, the goodness of the hill ground theory. But it had that starting, got the right starting. Apparently, if you're doing uh, approximations, it's not, uh, you can't start out with something way off and expect to have a converging theory as you go forward. Now, we know that Bumpere and Kolmogorov, Boser, Arnold and Boser, that uh, the lunar theory doesn't converge. But that is a simple consequence I gather, I'm told, of the fact that we have the small divisor problem. It's all over the place in celestial mechanics. We get small divisors and they pull off coefficients of improving pressure. Uh, but what seems to be possible is to get a what one very called an asymptotic approximation to what the moon actually does. And that, that should be a, uh, the people who go into that seem to feel that we ought to be amazed by it. Um, now, I think I should, uh, yeah, I should. Off. Uh, in 1984, there was good reason to uh, <coughs> first off, I'll put this. This is Newcomb's uh, diagram of what he called the fluctuation. This is a sort of descendant from Hansen's uh, empirical fudge, where he got a supposedly Venus perturbation of the moon, but he just took the remainder of the observations, what was left over, and said, okay, that'll, that'll make my theory fit. Newcomb came along and said, well, maybe your, your theory fits 1750 to 1850 uh, meridian observations, but I have observations, uh, observations of the moon, 
stars, by the moon, before then and after then, they don't fit. So you have to change it. And Newcomb didn't find uh, he despair. He died in despair. friction slows down the earth. So the earth is moving more slowly. And we, we know that now. Uh, so the earth was slowing down. Astronomers knew that. That didn't seem to put them to work trying to find new, finding a new sort of clock on the earth's rotation. But when Spencer Jones showed in 1939 that the fluctuations that Newton had discovered in the moon are also found in Mercury and other fast moving objects. The proportionality of their respective emotions. Uh, that was, that prints the argument. I started looking around for an alternative clock. And they invented something called ephemeris time. I don't have time to talk about ephemeris time. Mm -hmm. I think it was a mistake. But it was a lot of effort by then. Meanwhile, the atomic clock was on its way. It was really in place by 1955. By 1970, getting to nanosecond accuracy. Um, it was being established that uh, 
clocks and gravitational fields and <coughs> accelerated coordinate systems are slowed by either one or the other relative to this violation of time. And you have to start taking account of light time, the time light takes to get from where it starts out from a celestial body and gets to your telescope. You have to worry about the gravitational fields it goes through. <coughs> itself into this new culture with its new results successfully. JPL needed Ethan Maradis that were accurate to get people to land on the moon and things of that sort. Kind of important not to be off by 300 meters. <laughs> was getting humanities by numerical integration. They were engineers, they'd always done it that way. It was a good way to go. And they discovered a lot of things. They discovered, for example, the three asteroids had an influence on the moon that was sufficient, but they needed to take account of it. These monitors in the east didn't know. There were other people, mathematical astronomers, who still were concerned with analytical integration in which you actually get terms with coefficients uh, and say this is the way the world goes. First, Andre Dupree using V transforms to carry out multiplications of the series. Uh, he wanted to see how good Galani was. And he showed that Galani was pretty good. But he also aiming at a much higher precision, five ten thousandth of an arc second, and ended up finding he had uncertainties of one thousandth to five thousandth of an arc second. So this is still slow convergence relative. He and some colleagues then thought they would do a two-step and that's what the report reports in 1978. And um, there 
their the theory, which they give the acronym S-A-L-E for, is better than the A-L-E that we agreed on. Then Martin Gutzwiller in 1979 is carrying forward the work of Walter Emery, which uh, I knew he through the uh, development of the famous from what Eckerd had been doing to try to update the Hill Ground Theory. JPL's Eve Americans. So there's some kind of dependence there. Um, this is a theory which is not, which is derived from the analytically <coughs> all the way through, except for those numbers that are in the given. when he's actually able to develop a solution to a very high degree of accuracy. This is a consequence of the judicious choice of Hill's and immediate orbit as a starting point in the nature of the phase space in the vicinity of this world. It is possible to compute a formal solution in the sense of an asymptotic approximation, which matches the observational accuracy. Scott's brother made a, and Smith made a joint report in which they conclude that the hill ground theory of human motion is one of the great achievements of celestial mechanics. Thank you. Sorry to take so long.
out of sheer selfishness, I let Curtis go on rather than trying to hurry him up and um, or cut him off because I wanted to hear how the story ended. But that means that we have very little time um, for um, question period. We have about, about five minutes. Um, now, uh, I'm curious. Did you look into the, uh, the extent of Brown's uh, Bill, Bill's influence on Poincaré's work? Well, not really. I know that Poincaré praises Hill to the skies. Uh, I, uh, you know, uh, Brown at late life, there was some kind of little tension. He waited until Hill had died, a good many, or 20 years dead or so, and then pointed out that instead of using an infinite determinant, which Hill had used to get the motion of the moon's house. Um, you could simply take an approximation of, let's say, four places, put it in the differential equations, and come out with eight places, and repeat that as many times as you wanted. Uh, that is sort of crude quick and dirty methods. Uh, the Newton's method, actually, in the 1671 math treatise. Not a differential equation, but in an equation. So, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know enough about what the my brain was interested in the, in the two things that I would say about here, that, from what I know. One is the end of the determinant. I don't know what their future history has been for anybody. The other thing is that uh, Hill introduced the idea of a periodic orbit in phase space and then returning that. That is analytic continuation to get out to you know, various variations of that. But that's what I'm trying to say is the Hill Brown, the essence of the Hill Brown theory. It's true that, uh, as George pointed out to me yesterday, that there's this empirical term, and it's, there was a dreadful problem to these people that were talking about that were there. They really suffered from it. Uh, and they couldn't solve it until there was a way of showing that, yes, the Earth jerks around. It's moves around its axis and change the air pressure over the Pacific and the Earth changes shape a little and that's the speed of rotation. The core of the mantle apparently uh, got teamed together at one time or another and then apart. And uh, that makes a huge difference. All sorts of things are going on and people are studying it. So just very quickly, I wanted to make the point that uh, modern computer algebra systems are under development now, continually uh, following along with so one of the early successes in 1967 was to redo the Delaunay uh, expansion automatically and try and recover these kinds of things. And the techniques that you're talking about are themselves of interest not just in celestial mechanics but in all kinds of other vibration uh, analyses. And, and just to point out that the, the modern systems are up to computing with millions of terms and uh, there's just an enormous amount of interest in the tools themselves, not just in the physics of them, but in the history is really quite interesting and everybody. I was struck by that um, I hadn't realized that the title term, the, the title effects, the, I'll, I'll just play the gross when the slowing down of the earth and the time, that it was, I was, that it was after, only after that they had found it in, in, in ephemerides, showing up in ephemerides for Mercury and the other planets. 
not just the lunar theory, that that was what trans that you were saying it was at that point that they really decided to change the time <coughs> from using uh, the Earth's rotation and start. And that, that, uh, that was really that's a neat point. Can I just make an observation to Curtis? I understand the people at the time thought it was a great failing of Hill Brown, but in other places I've argued the greatest success of Hill Brown was to expose a discrepancy with a clear enough signature that we learned something new about the world. You think the role of theory is to learn about the world, not just to sit out there. Then the Hill Brown theory is the first lunar theory that enabled us to do that. And I think that's remarkable. I'm afraid we're out of time. Let's thank Curtis.